Good morning, and welcome to Heads Up, a show about mental health wellness. I'm retired counselor Sue Mullen, and with me today as my co-host, as always, <laughs> is licensed family therapist Diane Vaccarello. Good morning, Hi, Diane. Sue. Hi, Sue. Good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Um, I am excited about today's episode because, as you know, I have been talking about perfectionism for a very long time, yeah. and today we're actually going to do uh, the beginning of a deep dive into what it is, where it comes from, what you can do about it, and how perfectionism applies to our own personal lives. So I'm going to do what I, what I normally do with you, Diane, and that is go to my copious research. <laughs> and talk about what I found once uh, we determined that we were going to talk about perfectionism today. So right. this is what psychology today has to say about perfectionism. Perfectionism is driven primarily by internal pressures, such as the desire to avoid failure or harsh judgment. There's likely a social component to it, and it basically uh, has a lot to do with competition, even if that competition is just with oneself. So take it away, Diane Baccarella. I love that you do that research and just sort of like put out what's, what's out there because honestly, people can Google and take a look at this stuff, but we have to sort of also reintegrate it back into our actual daily lives and how we think as a human being. And it's nice that you brought up the distinction between perfectionism um, internally driven mm -hmm. and um, which can, you know, there's, there's a couple of layers here. We can have an individual who's very high achieving and that can be different than someone who uh, is perfectionistic. And so we should talk about the difference of that. Okay. And you're right. It can come internal about one's own standards or expectations of themselves, or it can be um, someone really feeling those expectations or pressures or standards from someone on the outside, meaning their parents or a boss, a coach on a team, a friend, anyone, you know, outside of themselves. And some people can actually have both. And that can be really, really tough. All right. So let me take you down uh, memory lane here for a minute, mm -hmm. because uh, you know that I always poke fun at the fact that I'm probably old enough to be your parent. Um, <laughs> so when I was a kid, uh -huh. the big goal for my family was to offer a college education to their children mm -hmm. because a college education generally meant that you were going to have a career and it was going to give you uh, a quality of life that you might not have otherwise. That was sort mm -hmm. of the, the, the plateau of expectation in my family. Mm. It seems to me now that, and all I had to do basically uh, it, it, to get there was to uh, you know stay out of trouble, get decent grades, decide what I wanted to do, uh, and make sure that, you know, I had the financial resources to, to go to school, but I didn't have the drive and desire to be an Olympic athlete, to mm -hmm. be the editor of everything, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, just per, uh, to, to lead world relief missions at the age of 16. I didn't have that, that awareness and I didn't, I, that, that even that other people were doing it. Mm -hmm. Where has all of this pressure to be perfect come from? That's a great question. I appreciate you describing sort of your experience um, in your youth. And, you know, I can add that I feel like in my generation, generation, um, X, yeah, that's the, my generation. Generation X I so. yeah. is, um, you know, I think there was a similar, I was the first to go to college in my family and it was um, not necessarily a set out expectation. It was there that it would be really nice and all of those things that you said. Um, but I can definitely say for me, I was internally driven to have high standards in a lot of different things. 
And I feel like there were times that I could notice myself dipping into sort of perfectionism and I was able to kind of regulate and recognize that wasn't, that wasn't good for me. It didn't feel good inside at all. So without having the pressure on the outside and having some high standards, I was able to kind of lock into what worked for me in a sense of really what felt good. It actually felt good. Mm -hmm. um, what you're saying is like an, a drive, a motivation. Um, there is a, um, again, there needs to be something that feels good for each of us. And that's why we can't have it be a one size fits all. I feel like one of the things that's happening with this generation, especially millennials, even I've noticed in the workplace and things like that, is that there is this um, sort of pressure that's built around high expectations and standards. And then if you just work absolutely really hard and push yourself and do all of these things, your life will be better sounds a little different than what you were describing in terms of, you know, you'd be able to have access to a job. You're, you're basically, you'd show up and you have access to whatever direction you sort of like want to take that in, but you're owning that. And I think right. what's happened is over time, there have been these pressures externally to have grades. If you can do this, maybe you can do this. And I think the goals and expectations, to be honest, have been set too high in a one size fits all sort of fashion. So we've lost this distinction with individuality and what does that person, what are they looking for and what are the ingredients within in them that match up to that? So as you were describing, the motivation on your end was not necessarily there to have a certain, but you were satisfied with whatever standard you had is what it sounds like. I could okay, ask that. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the word that I just picked out of that, uh, that sentence was satisfied. Yeah. We were satisfied. My parents yeah. were satisfied with the notion that you would go to school and do well, but you didn't have to be the valedictorian. Right. Uh, we, uh, I, my generation was satisfied with having a job that let you earn enough. Right, right. Even though the definition for of enough might have changed from home to home, there was yeah. sort of this general feeling that you didn't have to have it all. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things that have, um, has evolved a bit where these pressures of, of grades and scores and high achievement with schools and with parents and just society in general. The other thing I've noticed is that there's almost like this cloning thing that has happened. I think a lot of kids end up feeling this pressure to um, that success looks a certain way. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, previous shows we've done, we've talked about things like authentic self and anxiety and all of that, because it's all tied into perfectionism is tied into that. Mm -hmm. um, because if we're trying to achieve, again, from an external source, or even internal, the way we think it, um, achieve something that's not actually who we are, or what we are inclined to do, then we're going to have this disconnect and we're going to start having fear, aka anxiety, in this case, a lot of times, that the person or persons, if you're looking to externally um, be basically impressing someone, mm -hmm. um, the fear is that will they love you as much or pick you or whatever the case may be, if you stop being that perfectionistic or that producing, um, you know, on the outside of all of this. Right. And that leads to that fear of, I just got to keep doing more in order to be liked more or accepted more or successful. And that is a vicious, vicious cycle because it starts to deplete our sense of self. If we don't hit those marks, we mm -hmm. don't hit those scores. Um, we start saying things about ourselves and then bringing in an internal belief system that we're not good enough. So are people, are, are you born a perfectionist or are you made a perfectionist? So I, I think the high standards piece is something we can be born with. We can, we can be born with, um, there are certain features like even a people pleasing feature that, um, you know, can be commonly seen in this sort of set of recipe or ingredients. So there's um, sometimes a continuum of people who tend to be a little bit more people pleasing, tend to be a little bit more set up or prone to perfectionism. Mm -hmm. um, someone who's uh, conscientious, so really particular um, or, or attention to detail focused, that's just kind of in their nature or in their genetics, if you will. Wow. Um, 
somebody who has a layer of neuroticism is different. That's conscientiousness and neuroticism are very different things. One is uh, internal, the conscientious type. We were talking about the internally driven person. I bet you you're a conscientious type. I'm a conscientious type. Yes. And so, and then the neurotic type is one who is more externally trying to um, focus on, but it, neur neuroticism is sort of like having a hard time balancing emotions, managing emotions, um, mm -hmm. intensity. And so it's a reflection of the outside um, factor of really wanting to impress people, but it's, it's more of an attention to other people. Are they perfectionistic enough? It's judgment, which you've brought so in before. So like a worry about whether or not somebody is going to uh, think less of you if you don't perform to a certain level? Yeah, and how you also will judge them that they're not performing to a certain level. It's like a mirror, it's like a reflection. That's where that judgment piece comes in. So sometimes they'll be very attentive to how other people are not attentive, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So I think um, the, to answer your question, as far as born with, I think there's, there is the nature and nurture. We're set up with a certain number of sort of like ingredients, the introversion, extroversion thing applies a bit here. Um, but ultimately um, it's very different than having high standards or, you know, there's nothing wrong with um, working hard and having goals to achieve and being sort of um, motivated and along those lines. But again, is it, is it something that works for us? Are we okay with simpler or easier or all of those things are okay if we can accept that around you know and still as parents especially if we can sort of um, set some expectations or standards so that we can say hey you know it's really important in life um, to to set some goals for yourself or some you know expectations um, but we can't have them so high that people just shrink back from them we have to have a little like it's almost like a couple of notches ahead of where a person might be instead of five to ten notches ahead because then people either get really discouraged when they don't hit those marks yep. it's unrealistic then they start feeling bad about their own self-esteem and self-worth and capability or they just get discouraged and say why should I bother trying there's a sweet spot there and we can't be too high with those expectations or we are going to shrink away from them when I was uh, working as a school counselor, mm. I did a lot of uh, counseling around academic placement and yes. you know kids getting taking different levels of classes. Right. And uh, one thing, I mean, I think planning into the future is an important part of a child's academic life. Yes. Uh, but when I used to share with parents the fact that virtually everyone applying to an Ivy League school has a 4.0 grade point average or better. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a resume of extracurricular activities and leadership positions or whatever that you would wonder if the child ever went to bed. Mm hmm. They were, uh, people were, were oftentimes shocked, oftentimes surprised yeah. that uh, there was such a large pool of people right. that were able to live up to those standards. So how does one kid do it right. when another kid can't? Right. And that's what I meant about sort of a... Um homogenous sort of like culture we've created in a sense where, um, you know, there is almost like a, there was for a while sort of a cookie cutter approach it felt like to success. And so just taking the college piece on its own, um, I think in more recent years, people have been a little surprised that that recipe hasn't necessarily been applying in the same way. Sometimes schools haven't expect, accepted some student um, that was did have the 4.0 or more and all of these, you know, act, many activities and almost pre-Olympic, you know, level, that right, kind of thing. Right. And I think that's because we ended up getting, making so many of those, right? Where again, that's where the pressure build that this is the path that I need to be on in order to succeed or achieve or whatever. Um, people who are different from that, it's sort of, um, I don't think we're really necessarily with open arms sort of welcomed. It was more like, oh, I wonder why 
I wonder what happened, you know, if they picked some right. other path. So, um, but universities and colleges started uh, accepting different things than that cookie cutter approach. And right. I've seen that in recent years and that kind of shook, shook things up a little bit. Um, but to your point, it is important to have the placement sort of match not that we can say, oh, they they can. I think this is the the trap that sometimes happens is parents like, I know my kids are smart. I know they can do it, but there may be other things going on. And honestly, it's not a, a won't, it's a can't. Or maybe it is a won't, that willingness, that drive, they don't have that internal drive. So mm -hmm. that's not likely to happen long-term. It might be able to do that with a surge, but that's not something that they are willing or able to maintain. And right. so then oh. it just sets them up for failure. Over time, you mean to exactly. sustain over time. Yeah, yeah. So how do I know, um, how do I know if I'm being conscientious or being perfectionistic? So perfectionism, what comes with that is this idea, again, you were saying over time, a pressure to never let off the gas. Because once we have achieved something, again, there's that fear of if I drop back from this, am I going to be accepted? That whole thing, right? So there's a a drive to keep doing that and it's exhausting and it's constant. And so that doesn't feel good. And oftentimes the person, um, again, struggles basically with, uh, in the background of being accepted. With drive, there's sort of this um, sense of a person saying, you know, I'm gonna set some goals and if I don't hit them, I'm gonna learn from them. I'm gonna figure out things about myself or I'm gonna figure out things about a situation. Doesn't knock them down psychologically quite so much, it actually um, creates some motivation to surge forward, but the motivation is sort of internal and it's a little, it's longer lasting. It's co almost constantly there, but in a more pleasant way than the pressure to constantly perform. That's the difference between performance goals, which are usually externally driven and internal motivation to achieve, you know, whatever standard is yours. So and that's there what we need be, to know ourselves. About. There must be a lot of worry that comes along with uh, perfectionism. A lot of worry, exactly. Our our friend Psychology Today uh, highlights procrastination. Yeah. The tendency to avoid things. Mm -hmm. uh, all or nothing thinking. Yep. What, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? What, how, how big is fear of failure and how does it relate to procrastinating? It, it really is big and it sets up a binary thinking like the black or white, right? It's like succeed or fail. There's not much in between. And that feels like we're walking on a tightrope. So if you can just imagine the anxiety, right, that goes along with that and the dread um, that goes along with that. And dread is a pretty strong word, but it's applicable here um, because it also ties in with like a, um, a, a fear of trying to do something and not succeed. So that's where the procrastination comes in because mm -hmm. the idea that, okay, if I, if I haven't quite done that yet, um, part of it is that's just genuinely maybe not what we're wanting to do, but we can't admit it and we can't get unstuck from it. Um, but part of it is I'm working so hard all the time. I just don't want to do that. I just don't want to do anything. The idea of being perceived as lazy or being perceived as incapable is just too strong. And so again, it feels like we're trapped in a sense. That's the psychological sort of like fear that goes along with it. And so the, the motor is being driven um, almost constantly instead of somebody saying, you know what, and this is how we kind of address perfectionism. We have to intervene in our own patterns that are not working for us. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's sort of saying, I'm not going to respond to that email right away. I'm going to give it like 20 minutes or I'm going to give it the next day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it 24 hours um, and see if you can like work through that. If you can tolerate that, you know, it's a, uh, and see if the world ends, if, see if you the world ends, see if, see if you actually do get fired, see if your boss really does call you up and give you a hard time. And maybe that happens. Maybe that's not a good fit. Maybe you say I needed to do that for for my own health. And I've been working many hours over. Maybe there's some real justification for that. But what happens if we don't have, if we don't um, basically advocate for ourselves in that way, um, internally and then externally, is that uh, we do these other things that are more subconscious 
that do it for us, but we're not really owning that. So that's where some of the perfection, like the procrastination comes in. And we do end up getting maybe called out for that. But then we feel like, you know, we make excuses. Uh, students can do this. They'll say, I was up too late. And then I didn't get, you know, this done because I was so tired and sleep is really important. Start to like derail what actually is going on and come up with these excuses, sort of white lies. Then again, we're, we're getting into that area where we're starting to not feel good as a person about it, ourselves. It's interesting. I'm having, I'm having one of my aha moments here. Uh, I, I think that we have all had experiences with uh, either our own children or um, students or clients or whatever, mm -hmm. where we think that they're procrastinating because they can't do something. Right. And, and everybody seems to be able to make room for that. You know, that, yep. oh, Johnny or Susie isn't willing to try because mm -hmm. it's beyond them. You know, the poor, poor, poor kid. Poor dear. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what I, my aha moment is those kids or adults mm -hmm. that are very capable, mm -hmm. but are procrastinating to avoid the pressure that goes yeah. along with having to maintain that high performance. Exactly right. So that is a sign that the pressure is too much, perceived pressure even. Um, doesn't matter whether it's real or perceived, It's if it's perceived, it's real. And so that's the avoidance is from that pressure. So that means we have to change something much bigger of what's going on. Right, Not right. about being up late. So um, what about the black or white thinking? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so anxiety is also um, sort of a culprit for like forcing us more into black or white thinking, all or none. Um, it raises the stakes, raises the pressure, um, and it keeps us from going into the gray areas. So in other words, um, you know, I think a lot of this is on that plane of succeed or failure. Mm -hmm. And if we can say, hey, we're pretty much expecting there to be mistakes along the way. If there's a cu culture climate that supports the idea, again, of like um, setting goals and winning some and losing some, and well, what did you learn from doing that? It's, it feels a lot less um, like pressure and we can allow ourselves to have really solid experiences, good days and not so good days, but we don't um, fall into that sense of like not being able to do it again. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what leads to avoidance of just feeling like you're going to fail. And um, so instead it's sort of like um, take on these challenges. There's literally nothing more fun than taking on a challenge willingly mm -hmm. and open-minded right? We have to be able to have those kinds of energy behind it because then we can say, yeah, this is not feeling super binary to me. This feels like I have wide open space to explore, get curious, really like be self-driven and motivated to, to do something that I all of a sudden noticed, oh, I really like that. And I like how that feels. So I'm going to do that. Um, that's where we can see color. It's less black or white. We don't have just success or fail as our indicator. Diane, do we have, um, what's the prevalence of people who think that there are two, two standards? I mean, I, I'm kind of drilling down a little bit in the black or white thinking that there yeah. are two standards. There is performing at this level is the goal. Mm -hmm. And if you don't perform at this level, it means this. I mean, how prevalent is that? It's quite prevalent. I mean, the performance goals are definitely driven by success or failure. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, you know, it's tough because we have certain um, things in our sort of world around grades, whether you like, you're going to it's interesting. Grades are, are something that I noticed. There's some schools. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say the whole school thinks this way, but I'm saying sometimes can support this. Parents can have this mindset that, you know, we're really talking, we have A's, B's, C's, D's. Sometimes schools don't have F's or D's. It's interesting. In my, when I was growing up, we had A, B, C, D, and F. 
Right. Right. And some of that has been taken away, interestingly, right. Some of the gray. Um, but I think that there are some scenarios in which students know they are all those grades, but the only actual acceptable grade is like an A or a B plus, you know, something like that. So it shrinks the margin of what we're allowed to have. And B's and C's kind of fall off sometimes. People are just sort of like, well, if I'm going to get a C, I might as well get an F, right. right? And so then it drops a perfectionistic type of student into the idea of, well, I'm just going to, if I can't, if I think I can't hit an A or a B plus, um, I'm just, I'm just not going to do that assignment right now because I'm a little worried I might actually not hit that. And if there's a risk for that, I'm just going to uh, stop working and or pass in, you know, an assignment kind of half baked because that's not my assignment if I'm not the one really working hard for it. Um, or, you know, students will be at all A's and then they drop to they tank. And that's because they just don't even do the assignments. Right, but right. And it, protective. Well, and doesn't that take the authenticity out of the assignment to begin with? Because mm -hmm. if you're looking for whether or not somebody has mastered something and you're only de defining mastery by being an expert or, or you know, at the top of the great. scale, right, yeah. then that sort of perpetuates the a topic that we're going to cover in our next episode, mm -hmm. uh, which is the disaster of average, uh, the disaster of being average at something. Yeah. Yeah, or different, disaster of being different. The disaster of being different, right. Both of those things, I think, have a have a role. So I agree. Uh, the good news is that as we are coming to the close of part one of mm -hmm. Impossibly Perfect, mm -hmm. we are going to uh, record part two. And in part two, what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do is look at perfectionism across the lifespan Yes. So what do I do if I have a four-year-old that's perfectionist? Ah. What do I do if I have a 14-year-old? What if I'm 44? Mm -hmm. And take a look at uh, maybe the kinds of warning signs and interventions that we can introduce at different age levels to steer ourselves back more towards the acceptable. How's Excellent. that? That's Fantastic. I was going right. to say perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 not perfect. Just joking. Anything but perfect. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> okay, so I will uh, see you back here shortly and uh, keep your heads up. Sounds good. Bye, Sam. Bye-bye. Right. You got to keep your head.